Hello again, and welcome to another exciting episode of Mukadu Moment webinars for uh, Mukadu. And uh, we're excited to be doing Site Building 101 today. And um, we, it looks like we have uh, already a uh, relatively full house. We're still working through a couple of technical fun things here, but we're, we're getting going here. Um, and special session today, it's going to be two hours long. One second. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, we are Kelly. Hi. Michael. Tyler. Hello. So we're going back. Um, helping with the uh, overall informatics and technical requirements. We're having rain here in California for the first time, maybe this year. So it's confusing <laughs> everything. Uh, anyway, so uh, today we're covering Site Building 101. It's really great. We're going to have a two-hour session to talk through and work through actually building out a Mukadu site. Um, and then a little bit of change of the, of the schedule. Uh, in the two weeks, we're going to go through kind of the review of everything that's been happening, all the exciting things in the world of Mukadu, and give a preview of our plans for 2015. So we hope you'll join us for that. And then um, a little bit later, on the 17th of December, we're going to go through a full Mukadu 2.0 debut of progress, which will be really exciting. So we hope you can join us for that too. We are planning to do a full season two, and uh, we're starting to work through ideas for that. So if you have ideas for sessions you'd like us to do, different types of formats, uh, we want to hear about it. We also are going to introduce uh, office hours starting two weeks, holidays next week. Uh, so an open hour, at least every week, where you can come in and um, and we can just wrap on things. Which would be great. So once again, as usual, I'd like to give a, a great thank yous out to the funding funders and supporters, the various developers who have been helping to make we could do real over the last years, and of course all the different organizations um, and everyone here on the call, etc., who's um, part of the over overall growing Mukadu community. So thank you very much. The list continues to grow. Uh, I think we just are about to cross our 500th um, organization or individual in the Mukadu program. So it's very exciting. This number has grown quite a bit. Just a couple of points as usual. We have, uh, we are recording this session so that we can share it. And um, there's a, a chat box which you've already gotten to use uh, do the technical fun. So by all means, any questions you have, just put them on in there, and Tyler or we will uh, acknowledge them and make sure that your questions are heard. This is supposed to be a dialogue. So by all means, and there is a raise hands function. You can tap on and try that either way. You can also tweet us at Team Coda, any, any way you want to communicate with us, and, and we're done. So at this point, are there any questions? Great. Questions? <laughs> uh, okay. So just a quick review of our agenda. We're going to have an opportunity to meet uh, Christopher Mule here, who's uh, joining us from the Brooklyn Arts Council. We've been working with over the last week on developing at the site. And then we're going to take you through uh, the rest of the agenda. I'll let Kelly take us through, which is basically talking about tools of the trade, how we develop sites um, and work collaboratively. To, to make we could decide it's real and talk a bit about our archival media processing. Uh, then we're going to spend a full hour building the site, going through all the different documents and um, and show you some results that we've been able to do over the last couple of days. Did I miss mm -hmm. anything? Um, no, sounds about right. Probably missed a lot. There's <laughs> a lot, a lot to show, but you'll 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 see that very soon. So as I said, first first out, outcome is just to to meet Chris, who's been great to work with over the last week um, and get a bit of background on the Brooklyn Arts Council. And then uh, go through the process of building a site and hopefully leave you off with ideas of where to go so you can be building your own sites and projects. So we want to talk a bit quickly about Mukadu 2.0 and where things are at with the project. But things are going phenomenally well. So Mukadu 2.0 is going to be our fully open source release of Mukadu CMS. 
it's slated for the beginning of the year, kind of January, uh, February timeframe, where uh, we'll talk about a couple of ways you can be um, engaging with us on the project. Um, it's being led, the engineer work is being directly led by Washington State, us, and Canopy Studios, um, and things are going really, really well. So the major features of that will include a one-click install, you just go to a web form, hit a button, and get a site. And I'm going to take this off because what's happening is there's this great echo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now that I know the audio works. So one click install will be great. You'll be able to go in, hit a button, and, and get your own site. The code will be fully open source and released through GitHub, and we have a whole process we're working through so that um, if you want to collaborate and develop, you'll be able to do that completely. It's going to be fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and we were just at Bad Camp, and we got really great responses from the Dru overall Drupal community. So everyone's excited um, and banding around uh, the project to make it as awesome as possible. A completely new and redefined uh, 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 based on all the feedback we've had over the years on access protocols, content management, um, and our archi archival media management uh, system that's state-of-the-art and fantastic and one-click uh, mobile, MOOC to mobile integration for every single site. So very exciting things um, coming along with MOOC 2.0. So still slated for January 2015. And how you can help is you can reach out, contribute, comment. Uh, we've had some fantastic opportunities uh, to work. Uh, we recently worked with the um, RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology, and then Julia may be on the call with us. Um, if she's not, she will be, I'm sure. Let's see, not yet, but we expect her to be. Uh, doing some really great testing, um, and that a, 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 will be a great opportunity. Our real essential need will be to do a, a testing program, and then helping plan for the future. So once it's kind of there and, and, and legitimate and working, we want to really work with you to figure out all the things that, um, that you might need to make it uh, better. So please help us make MOOCD 2.0. That's basically the idea. Uh, any questions so far? All right. So uh, we're going to get right into it. And we are shockingly right on time. So there you go. <laughs> um, so let's begin. And I'm going to hand over um, the screen. All right. So. Get my hands up. So it's been an exciting beginning of the week for us here. Yeah, we've been uh, I, we've been working with Christopher Moulet from the Brooklyn Arts Council, and I wanted to introduce you now, Chris, if you want to open up. I think we turned on your mic. Yeah, feel free to share your. Um your webcam too. Um, so we contacted Chris uh, last week um, to work with us on getting a Mukuru, um CMS site built. Um, and we've pretty much just thrown him in the deep end of like, this is this resource and this is that resource and trying to plan as quickly as possible. Of course, he's had a lot of time to just think about what the goals of his Mukuru site is. He's been a Mukuru user for a while. And um, it's been a really exciting and great journey. Um, so I just wanted to, we're here um, right now to talk about the tools of our trade, the steps from uh, launch to launch from start to finish. And um, with that, I wanted to show a little presentation I made, um, which is the five minute guide to your CMS. And I'll try not to do that. Okay. Um, so, this is the five minute guide to you, the landscape of Mukadu. And it also goes over a little bit of the planning that um, we should consider when building a site. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with Premiere. A lot of you are site administrators on your own. And the first impressions of a new Mukuru CMS site can be a little daunting or full of question marks. You kind of just get a header, a button, and you're just thrown into the deep end. So we've been here to kind of um, hold Chris's hand, help him out, um, show him our process. And um, we wanted to show that with, share that with the the community today. 
Um, so we have at CODA have a very fine-tuned process of taking a site from start to finish. Um, and at first it's a little difficult. It feels like a lot of responsibility to be able to have to translate your projects from legacy access, assets into the project. Um, and what we call legacy assets are the data, the stories, the media, the traditions. Um, we mean the whole content produced by your project from start to finish. And um, if you're just starting out, your legacy assets might not even be existing. Um, or if you're um, still performing your project, your legacy assets might be incomplete. But it's always have to, good to have a plan for the archival storage and the file storage uh, structure of your legacy assets and how you'll be responsible. Um, responsibly share them through MOOCU or other media um, as well as acting. So um, let me go back to this first slide here. And so as you probably know, um, Mugadu is made up of communities and cultural protocols that interact together to um, give those permission, um, sorry, give your site audience permission to share or view cultural heritage items. Um, the cultural heritage items or the digital heritage items are the big picture and uh, that's the story and the narrative, the description that goes with the media, which is the content and the visual aesthetic of your site. Um, and then we have the categories and categories are the, the what. So what will users want to view when they go into your site? And you can think of different users. So some of them will be parts of your communities um, or if you have an outreach program, you might also be sharing with the public as well. Um, but it's really up to this, the, yourself, your project's needs, um, and how you set up the site. So that ties in with having a purpose um, and having a plan. And we'll go deeper into it. All right. So the communities and the cultural protocols are what makes Mukuru unique. And um, as some of you might know, there's three levels of sharing for each community or cultural protocol. The communities are the who. So the communities are who the content is about or for. And you can make your communities open so that everyone um, can view them. Users and visitors can see anything, any digital heritage item posted within an open community. And then you can also make it um, community or strip community. So community is registered users who have been invited into the community can see items. And a strip community um, is really to be used for when multiple communities and protocols intersect. So a strip community can be used to trump all other things like these are digital heritage items and these are the people who are sharing these digital heritage items who really just want to share them within their, their tighter group. Um, is there a limit to how many communities you can have? There is no limit to how many communities or how many cultural protocols you have. So you can make them, I, I do recommend starting out broad with um, the wider communities that you're impacting and then creating the protocols for how. So every once in a while you'll come up across an item that really just should be shared with one or two people. And you can create a cultural protocol for that because only those users will be able to see those, those cultural protocols. It doesn't um, affect the overall usability of your site. Mm -hmm. So I tried to make a screen of the mixing and matching that could happen um, with some of your communities and protocols in action. So we have Buddy, who is a member of Community A, which is the open community. Actually, it's easier to, I'm going to escape the presentation mode and look at it like this so that we can see what the sharing settings we put on our communities are. Um, so Buddy is a member of Community A. Lisa is a member of Community B, which has the um, community sharing protocol on it. 
Che is a member of Community A and Cultural Protocol A, and shared, Sharon is a site visitor, so she doesn't have a login and she has no affiliations. So the mixing and matching, um, if we were to put just Community A, which is that open community, on a digital heritage item, all four of these users would be able to see this because it is an open item um, and no other communities are interacting on it. But then if we add a community tag like community B on it or community group on it, um, we notice that Sharon can no longer view it. Um, that's because it's being shared with registered users who are members of both community A or community B. Um, so Buddy can see it even though he's not a member of the community B. And Lisa and Che can see it because they are members of Community B. So this is a kind of Community B sets the either or community sharing protocol. So with that whichever communities you put on your item, all of them can see them. Um, and then we see an item with only Community B on it. Um, and I think I misspoke last. I said Che was a member of Community B, but he's not. He's a member of Community A. Um, so since only Community B is on this item, Lisa is the only one to see it. Um, but when we see a, a strict sharing cultural protocol or a strict sharing community um, on an item, it overrides any of the visibility of the other community or protocols on the item. So Che is the only member of cultural protocol A, and since cultural protocol A is a strict community, and it's on this item, he is the only one who can see it. So. That's, that's it, that's the <laughs> primer. And, um, and really, you know, this, this, this is what really makes um, Mukri CMS um, kind of unique as a content management system, but it's also the hardest thing to really define and explain. The easiest yeah. way to think about this is just to clarify, when you think about your own content and the users who um, are gonna be accessing it and the various kind of terms that would be used, mm -hmm. um, that are just in practice within the communities, this all of a sudden makes a whole lot of sense. You know, um, and so all of us who are part of the organization at the Center for Digital Archaeology can see and move through each room. But you know, I have I have an office and there's certain stuff that that um, I you know I don't have access to, and Kelly has her desk and the same kind of thing. So it 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 starts mystical, and and as you build more and more content, mm -hmm. um, it it starts to clarify itself really fast. Um, so this, um, this presentation is also um, public on the web, um, so we'll go over later how to reference this presentation if, it, if you find it helpful to view these items. Um, um, and then the categories. Categories are what your users will expect to be find when they visit your site. Um, so I recommend a, a broad and finite set of terms between um, 10 and 20 seems to be a really sweet spot for categories because if you have more than 20, it kind of just gets muddled down and users can be, um, it can be a little overbearing to find what you need. But if you have a number of stories, events, art practices, people or places, then you're setting it up where a user can go and find you know a festival that they attended last year or a story about their grandmother or some um, maybe even contribute some media from an event that took place um, so sorry my mouse is very sensitive <laughs> um, so that's kind of the idea of the categories and if you ever need to feel the need to get more specific with your categories you can also have keywords so um, maybe if you want to have different sets of people like you don't want to be so broad as to say all people but you have I don't know teachers and students and visitors and and whatnot you can get that um, distinct in your categories so I mean, one, one thing to say here because Oops. we're dealing with a quite sophisticated audience and lots of digital librarians mm -hmm. and curators on the call so categories uh, are one of those things where it is about what users as we wrote will expect to find and it is a bit of 
you're trying to be kind of clairvoyant, right? Mm -hmm. So there are all these kind of broader based categories. These particular categories we've chosen are, are kind of the safe ones, you know, people, places, things, and media. Mm -hmm. Lots of the different um, cultural heritage and digital heritage um, sites and projects we've seen are used in the who, what, where, when, they're kind of core principles. Mm -hmm. But as Kelly said, you can go a lot further if you want to tag something with a very specific person um, there's no reason to not do that. We just tend to see within how it's been implemented using Drupal, um, that's where tags come in or what they call folksonomies. But it is completely within the capabilities of the software to have as, as many categories as you want. Mm -hmm. It just becomes at some point overwhelming. And so it's, it's the same principle. This is again what we're learning throughout the last you know decade or so is just that a little bit goes a long way. So. Um, where you, you can have as many categories as you want and any, any taxonomic terms that you want to use is perfectly um, capable and doesn't require the software in this case to have to be re rebuilt to, to add them, which is another really kind of key, key aspect of, of the software. Mm -hmm. um, yes, just one slide over. Um, and then we start thinking about media. And sometimes this can be another big hurdle. You have this entire content. Sometimes you have thousands of media items and you're not sure what collections to start with or what to focus on for your, um, your digital heritage items. And a lot of times um, your categories will actually aid you um, in selecting your media. But we also want to address the entire life cycle of media. Um, so from capturing the moment to sharing the DH metadata or to sharing digital heritage items in your site, there are a lot of steps and only the last three really are pertain to Mukadu. So just best practices and sustainability will really help you um, to create um, a file structure that's meaningful for you, but also making sure that if you have grants that you're working with, making sure you have archival copies of your files. Um, if you're importing into Mukudu, you might want to think about the size of your files so that someone can load the image from anywhere in, in the world and it won't just completely push them over their data limits um, or whatever. Um, that's actually a really important point because, and, and one of the things that we, um, that we're trying to address in Mukudu 2.0 mm -hmm. is the ability then to have an archival quality item. So a quick example would be um, an archival TIFF file from a Canon 6D will be about 119 or 130 megabytes for that one file. But, you know, with a, with a good workflow as we're describing here, we can actually make a representation of that item that's perfectly suited for the web that has all the embedded metadata that refers to that original item that can weigh 800K and still be full resolution mm -hmm. on the screen. So that a lot of that stuff, um, the heavy lifting has to be done using external processes. There are web ways of doing that and we're hoping to be able to leverage those again when we have uh, 2.0, so that's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and so once you have uh, your representatives chosen, you can then start either working with them directly within the software of Mukudu or staging your batches for import. And if, if you have a lot of items and you're already familiar with Mukudu, um, playing with batch importing can be tricky, but in the end, learning it really well is going to pay off hours of your life back. I'm just telling you, um, the Mira Canning Soccer Out project, I'm sure we've shown it before, it was um, 20,000 images and we didn't start importing those images until a, um, a week before our soft launch. Um, and that would be six months after processing. Yeah, <laughs> so, we, <laughs> so really the processing was all for the moment of import. And then when you kind of get the import down, it's really fulfilling just to see hundreds of items at a time just populating your site and um, that's what we did last night with Chris's site not hundreds but um, we got a good sampling and we'll we'll go through that in a moment and so then adding the media to your site and importing digital heritage metadata 
Um, and for the batch import, it is just a spreadsheet. Um, but there are required fields that need to look exactly as they look in your site. Um, so I've just kind of put some sample items. So if your list of communities are community A, community B, you have to make sure that they look, they're written exactly as the term would be in your site. Same with cultural protocols um, and categories. And then also with media, because you're going to be putting those media files into your site and you have to tell um, the batch importer what file to pull into what digital heritage item. So every single line in your digital heritage spreadsheet is going to be a single digital heritage item. Um, and you can think maybe you want to batch based on um, what your categories are. Um, so today I'm just going to batch all of the events that happened in 2014. That's a really good way to scope your batches for import. And then you, you have a list of every single event that happened in 2014. You have a single line for each one, and then you can continue to fill out the metadata for those. So one more quick thing here. Um, we just get, we did a, a training here on Friday here at CODA on, on the whole archival imaging workflow, and that was a two-hour training. Um, it could have gone on for a whole day. Batch import is something we, we definitely want to do a full immersive training on. The only reason we're pausing on that right now is because it's all about the change with PPD 2.0, mm -hmm. meaning that the, the, the actual objects, the digital objects that are being added will include, as it says here, event 001R, which is representation plus we could have a, a thumbnail, and could have a full quality image, you could have an audio file attached. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be really interesting to see how that all works. But, um, but do stay tuned. So uh, early in 2015, we plan to do a full set, probably multiple <laughs> uh, webinars specifically on the batch import because it is really great. Another thing we want to point out is that you see that's in plain language. By the way, it doesn't, I, I won't say plain English because it could be in any language actually. It's UTFA compliant, another key point. But it is in plain language um, because that was the most sought after feature uh, for the overall MOOCADU community internationally. Um, there are fancy ways of doing this using feeds and other technical approaches, which are also going to get cheaper in 2.0. And then finally, once you have all of your items in the site, um, it's all about sharing and curation. So you could think of your site as a digital uh, museum almost. So making meaningful relations um, is actually a manual process because it's meant to be thought through. Um, so when we talk about relations, that's what shows up on the right side of the screen when you're looking at a digital heritage item. So maybe you'll have an event and um, you want to show the coordinators of the event or some of the outcomes of the event, some of the media items, you can create a separate digital heritage item and share those and, and, and make relations from one step to the other so that an end user is literally guided through stories in your site. Um, and we'll talk about setting, making relations and setting things up as sticky a little later. Um, and then a front page can go a long way and um, we're going to show you a little bit about curating a front page app in our next section. Um, and then uh, if you'd like to visit this online, you can look at the advice, but we'll also touch base on some of these things in the meeting. All right. So let's get Chris on the call and, um, and talk about, about his project. Yeah. I'm going to pull up his, um, maybe the, his actual BAC, not, the, not this one. <laughs> <laughs> but the um, but the BAC. Uh, Sorry, right. guys. <laughs> okay. Chris, can you hear us? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. You hear me? All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, apparently, GoTo Meeting doesn't want um, fifteen people to share the webcams at the same time, so it's blocking. <laughs> we're we're still learning. GoTo Meeting. That'll be our. Uh, that'll be also part of our season two trainings, I'm sure. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say thanks to, to Kelly and Michael for uh, incorporating me in this process. Um, so I'll just explain a bit about my, where I'm coming from. I'm sure a lot of users come from different um, angles with this product. So um, again, my name is Chris Mule and I work for the Brooklyn Arts Council as a folklorist. Um, 
So I am the considered the regional county folklorist for um, Brooklyn, New York State. We have about 30 folklorists throughout the state. Um, and that's, it's been that way since the mid seventies. And our job is to present, preserve and document cultural uh, traditions and try to um, keep traditional arts practices going, whether that's through um, public programming, um, documentation and preservation or apprenticeships. So, um, so I've been here for about uh, seven months in Brooklyn, but before that I've been in Staten Island. So you'll see some of overlap of Staten Island um, in the site that these guys put together. Um, so just to give you a, a, an idea of what a, a folklorist would want to do with this, um, in, in sort of the folk arts or folklore and ethnomusicology, but more folklorist, um, there's a long history of archiving. Um, and usually putting that material in a place like the um, traditional archives of Indiana or um, the Library of Congress, which are all great things, um, any academic fields, that's very important. But when you're someone that works for the public, I'm, I'm actually, you know, some of my salary is paid by the state, um, so it's, it's public money. Um, the question becomes, what is, uh, are we to do with these archival materials? And not only that, how can they be um, uh, relevant to the communities we work with? Now, as someone that works for an arts council, um, it's not only important, I think, to have these materials available for the communities, um, in, a, in a very, um, you know, uh, in, a, in a more monitored way, but it's also material that can be used to, to raise funds. Um, these, you know, we, part of our job at an arts council, most arts councils is to um, give grants, um, to help facilitate grants. So my, where I'm coming from is sort of how do I work with um, my materials? Now, I, if you would see me, I'd show you, um, when I walked into my job, the last folklorist was there for 18 years. There was someone there that was uh, there for 10 years. So I'm looking right now at a box of uh, DVDs, um, uh, reels to reels, um, and they tell an interesting story of you know the the Gilio feast that's been going on for 125 years in a place like Williamsburg, Brooklyn, a neighborhood that's really changing, becoming the hipster capital of the world. Um, but the story that we can tell through these archives uh, is important, not just to the broader community, but to, to the people that um, are of that heritage. Um, so my interest is to not only sort of uh, give access to these communities in a way that's um, ethical for them, because it is a fear that people have when you show up with a camera. It's no longer someone walking around with, you know, the Alan Lomax Presto machine that's in back of a truck. Um, where it just seems like he's doing magic, you know, um, everyone's got a camera and, and the internet is ubiquitous. So um, to be able to, to offer something, an interface where communities can build on materials and see materials um, is really important. There, there's a Lomax story of how he went to the Caribbean and um, recorded some traditional musicians, but then took his speakers, you know, as the back of the truck and blared the music back to the to the um, musicians, uh, to the to the community, and they were asking who who are who is that, and it was them that he reported. For them to hear themselves was so important, and that's what I see happening with um, having the access to these materials. It can really show these communities um, something about themselves, and in a in a framework that's really ethical. So that's why I like the the Mukuru process. Um, but as I said, we're sort of in this new era of born digital materials that I'm collecting. I'm also inheriting an archive but um, that needs to be digitized. But more importantly, I'm interested in the repatriation of the materials, but also not just throwing this stuff up there, but making communities part of this process of um, reviewing the material, adding um, content to it, telling stories about stories. Um, in a way that's comfortable for them. And I, I think this would be a, a, just a great tool um, for not only uh, the, my position, but uh, for the entire community. And we work with a bunch of archivists or archives throughout the state that are also in this position, that have this material, but don't necessarily know what to do with it, and feel that the regular archive, the usual archive uh, model is just not enough for them. Um, so that's, that's pretty much how I, uh, I'm coming at it and um, just super excited to, to learn more about uh, seeing this go from, you know, uh, Excel spreadsheet to, to an actual live thing. So.
Yeah. Well, that that was fantastic, <laughs> and thank you again. And um, and I, you know, for everyone else who's on the call, if these kind of concepts that, that Chris Christopher just um, outlined resonate with you, we'd love to hear about. It. So please write write in the in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, so so. Um, um, so that everyone can can share because these are what you just described are are the classic um, needs that we're seeing um, that we're hoping that the MOOC and CMS can actually help to address. So awesome. Um, so I guess without further ado, unveiling um, the process. Uh, let's let's just jump into the process. It's ten forty. If we're doing great. Okay. All right. So, and, and so, 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 Chris, we're going to leave your mic on. So, by all means, um, be chatty and, and let's, I'm just going to sit back and watch the magic okay. happen. Cool. Um, so, our journey began last Thursday. I reached out to Chris to see um, if he, he was interested in building a site with us under like a really short timeline. <laughs> I'm like, it's going to be rigorous and we're going to ask you a bunch of things that you've just totally been up to the challenge and if you tell me what to do I can do it I'm like oh I thought I had given you too much so cool I'll give you some more things to do um, so essentially I asked him I did a, what we call a data audition and we talked about um, some of the purpose and project scope um, in an email and got some of, you know, what are your short term goals, your long term goals, um, the basics, what's your project name, um, <laughs> target audience, etc. And I won't show too much on this because it was an email, private email, but um, I translated that into the um, product requirements and functional specifications template. And typically from there, we'll go and get an idea of, you know, what the whole, if it was a bigger project, we would have gotten like all of the media and metadata from, from you, Chris, and started taking that. Um, but we focused on a small amount um, and started taking me through a longer process. So that's just one, um, one of the things that we like to get um, in the process of um, planning is all right what what do you what are your goals for this project and what do you want to see come out of it and then you can start thinking about you know the whole life cycle of your site etc um, so from there we went to a mood board and I have a mood board here we go So um, What's a mood board. A mood board is <laughs> essentially um, the idea of what the overall user experience of your site is. Some of the colors that are being used, the images being used to represent the site, and this um, really is, it, it outlines the goals, but it also it typically outlines the goals, um, and it also kind of gets the aesthetic rolling so that Chris can go, okay, well, I really like where you're going, but I, I hate the color green. So can you please just get it out of my site or, you know, things like that. Um, so that when we go live, it's not a surprise, like, no, we can't go live because I don't like green and you made this entire site hate green. Um, I don't know if Chris likes green or not. It's, it's not really I'm fine with that. <laughs> um, so I took um, some of the logos and graphics that uh, Chris gave me and some of the text about the project and kind of translated that into a front page application. Um, I also created a really quick Google form that Chris would fill out, um, like saying, this is going to be the first section of the front page and this is the, these are the images that I want and here's the about section um, and some of those goals. And I translated that into our content list. So here is item number two, <laughs> our content list. Um, so the content list just kind of lays out the front page one by one. So what's going to be on the menu, the logo, an about section, some projects, and an entrance. So first we start with the showcase, um, and that's four carousel items. 
Um, and typically we would make these, um, probably give these some text um, to invite the user to interact with the carousel. So the front, the first one might be um, visit the sweetest or check out the sweetest song project um, from 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, and et cetera, through all of these projects that are beautifully displayed through these images. Um, and then um, we have an about block with um, some text about the general project. Um, and then block three, it kind of pulled out. Um, it's just a, a carousel feeding some of the projects from the site and a footer because we do need to give um, attribution to our partners, our team, our sponsors. That's super important, especially when we're putting a public site online, even if all the content is private. The sponsors want to be <laughs> want to be given homage. Yeah. Um, so so um, typically, this is the first step. But at the same time as I'm doing this, I'm building the actual page. That it's going to be. So these are screenshots, of course, of the front page. But it kind of gives um, it lays out kind of um, an environment where Chris could go in and write a comment saying. This is actually Staten Island Art Council or <laughs> Council or CIL versus SEL. Yeah. And the document begins as um, as kind of as a brain dump and mm -hmm. then gets tighter and tighter and tighter until it finally becomes a build document. Once it's a build document, our, our recommendation would be to go ahead and, and just agree with your with whoever's helping you contribute to that process that this is going to be our first edition mm -hmm. and let it be okay <laughs> because you're going to still have an opportunity to review it before it ever goes live before it ever gets whatever your public might be but the process will take weeks or months or never if there's a continual cycle of kind of re-editing and worrying and being per perfectionist so you want to get everything right you want to get the language right and all mm -hmm. that um, through this process and that's what we actually love Google Docs for that because you can go in and you can do things. Mm -hmm. It's really, really great for that. And there's also um, a new suggesting mode in Google Docs. So um, if I were another contributor and I just didn't like this sentence, I could press the delete button and I'll do that. Delete. And instead of deleting it, it says, hmm. how you would like to delete this? <laughs> or, ah. um, and th this has actually been a totally fantastic thing for other projects we're working on where where we this inverts the, the power in the mm -hmm. <laughs> we might make a suggestion or an editor might make a suggestion and then you go well actually the person that's confirming this in this case would be chris chris you would go through and go right i like that line don't delete it or mm -hmm. gosh do we really yeah. want to this in that room or whatever you know it becomes really uh or, dialogue or we can have an entire dialogue about it or you know whoever has the final say has the final say so they can accept or reject mm -hmm. Um, so next, once we have approval, which we've got approval for this front page content, because Chris actually told us exactly what we need to do, so that was good. Um, <laughs> and uh, we turned it into a show. I can't make it not <laughs> La la la. Look over here. <laughs> So this worked um, because we hadn't had the link set up for any of these items. We can just click on them, and each one of them actually just gets to about the project. Um, but we see we could enter into the site by going through the projects, um, and every single section has a call to action. So if you want to come inside and look at some of the stories that people have shared, you can click the button here. You can click the enter button, or you can click to view one or many projects. Mm -hmm. um, and then we started on content. Did we talk? Check your audio. Okay. Is that okay, everyone? Yeah. Okay. 
the rain, it just throws everything off. <laughs> but it's good. I'm so happy it's raining. When we have a drop, the prices go up. <laughs> we had no rain last year. Okay. Um, so then we started kind of playing in the site. And I want to direct you all to um, the URL here. Um, the URL says dev dash mu 523. And that's because all um, hosted sites are actually free environments. So I'm going to pull the back end here. This is the disclaimer we say, sorry, geek alert, but it is an important thing for you all to know because one of the things that's really important about how we've designed this with these really fantastic folks at Pantheon is by having three different environments, um, your, 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 your content is always safe because it's in this production environment, but you can still make you can still play with things, and that's what development, development, development environment is. Um, so we did this all on the development site to kind of get it all staged and set up and play with things. We can um, add communities or protocols and switch users and test them. And um, actually, I'm going to log out and log back in as not an admin. Because. Yeah, so. I'll just add that that was really helpful for me to go into that um, dev environment, you know, and because I did, I mean, you, you guys witnessed it. I did sort of play with, you know, different categories and, uh, you know, different communities and sort of move things around. It, it sort of helped me think about it, I think. I know. Yeah, that's a great point because you mean, you know, uh, we tend to think of the dev environment in the kind of true pure software form where it's a, it's the environment where you test new modules, but it's also a really great place to test out mm -hmm. categories and protocols and, and, and do that without it having to be live on your site. You know, there's nothing more dis disruptive and, and distracting than having the site change before your eyes you know, all the time. Yeah. So that's, that's another great finding of this process. Thank, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. Um, and then when you're ready and you feel comfortable, we can push it to test and to live, which is what we've done, what we did last night. Um, also, I think an important point, what you're seeing here, and this is all also worthy of its own, probably, probably but when we say we are doing this, the whole point of Mukadu on, on Mukadu.net is this is actually your environment. You get a dev, te dev test and live environment, and you can do all these things yourself. So, you don't want to, we're happy to help. But mm -hmm. it is something that once the site is committed to a project, um, it is totally yours. We're kicked out um, unless you invite us back in, and we're here to help if you can. Mm. Yeah. And then uh, we also really, really um, strongly recommend that once you're comfortable using um, adding content, adding control protocols, once you're comfortable with that process, Go to live, do things live because the dev environment really is supposed to be. There are different environments for different people. The dev environment is for the people who are pushing the code. Um, and if you have a, a Pantheon hosted site, um, the sandboxes we we still do make sure that your site is running. So we'll log in and do do a commit. We, yesterday we had some updates to the core. Um, code um, and push them through and just make sure and testing, you know, visit the testing site, make sure nothing's broken, like maybe in a big messed up all of the groups or whatever, um, and then push it to live for you. But we'll always tell you if we're going to go. What's in the site here? <laughs> um, and similarly, if you have your own IT folks doing this, that's the kind of dialogue you want to be having with them yeah. to say, uh, what, what is your protocol for when changes are going to be made, when, mm -hmm. when are commits going to be made, who, who, is it, who owns backup? <laughs> are you going to consider the backup? Mm -hmm. We're happy to talk about all that. Okay, um, and then we'll talk about, I guess, the content. Do we want to do the batch or the content? Content. Okay. <laughs> So um, once Chris was comfortable um, with where his communities and categories were at, um, we created this document. 
and it's called a content manifest and it's filled with numbers and dates and things and that's all machine readable you really don't have to have any information except for probably the title of your protocol and you know what the sharing protocol is um and these were all just automatically exported from the site um on the flip side of things you can stage all of your protocols in here and your communities in here and then read them in your site you know it's, it's however you're comfortable doing that sort of a thing but this is kind of a reference um so that if people are batching um content into the site they have okay what are my protocols and it's very clear okay this is an open protocol i'm going to make the decision to put it on this item but maybe this the sharing protocol will put a, a strict protocol on it so that it's not shared publicly um, and it's shared just within your community so um yeah there's a couple couple very important points here one and and, and again th this is all this is our process we've stumbled upon over the last but one of the very first things we, we worked through when, we, when i was specifically working with him Kristen, and we were trying to figure out what the promise would be to various communities is this notion of round trip, where you put content into something like Lucidu or any content management system, you should be able to get it all out without having done any harm to the content. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, is that even in, you can do it all front end, you know, add your protocols and communities and all that. And that's what we're, we're doing. That's how this is built. But it's really a good idea to have an external mm -hmm. data environment. And it's so easy to read here, and we put, we provide these documents to everyone who wants them, where you can just see your list of communities, you can see your list of categories. And as you can see, there's some of the media things you can even have. Uh, the communities can even have a representation of it. All that can actually be stored in the CMS. But here, it's external. If anything, if it takes anything ever goes wrong, you know, or if it's a batch of that import process and it goes haywire, you always have those backups. Um, yeah. So it's, it's a great, great thing. And Turns out it's easy enough to just export directly out of it to generate this list. Hmm. And actually, do you mind if I log in as an admin one more time to show how easy that is? That's your decision. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll go for okay. it. <laughs> I don't want to be showing any content that might be. I mean, there's, there's only one item that's under non public, but. I and uh, that's again another point you'll see that Kelly is going to always ask if we're working in a collaborative space. Um, since we haven't written all the documents together yet, <laughs> that we're always going to ask if, to, to have permission to go in um, under a more powerful role like an admin. A lot of that's also being addressed in a much more interesting way with Mikudi 2.0 with some much more fine grained roles, um, which is going to be really, really sweet. But for now, we just try to be polite. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've just um, written in a, it's essentially a command, but it's a URL where I've written cultural protocols export to CSV. And if I press enter, oops, sorry, it's singular. Um, it did it. It just downloaded a CSV of all yeah. of the cultural protocols. Um, so you can do that with um, category. Hmm. And this can only be done by an admin, which is why I logged out and logged back in again. Um, and whichever whichever terms you want to uh, export. And then you could also, on the flip side, if you were going from dev to live, you could import them into your live environment. Um, there's one thing I need to do is delete, it enters a row above, so I'll just delete that row. Yeah. So you can make changes to that and then upload it, import it. You totally can. I mean, if, can you show on the dashboard real quick um, on the site? Go to the dashboard. Um, again, what, this is going to be changing soon, but you'll see in the, down here this whole um, manage content. And there's um, beyond that, there's these steps of add media, import many cultural protocols, communities, features, categories. Mm -hmm. That, those steps, and that, that is the batch process that, that feeds off of these documents. So if it's already been added and there is that unique identifier, it will update. If, it, mm -hmm. if there is a unique identifier, it's going to add it. 
um, which is which is awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and step one is always add media because if you have um, a media PSD <laughs> and it's not in the site, uh, none of these have media items. But if you have media in your PSD for an item and it's not actually in the site, then it just gives an error. It will import the node, but it'll it won't import the media, obviously. <laughs> right. So this order does matter of add add media first, and then the protocols, and then communities, and then the users. Which makes sense, right? I mean, if I'm going to have a user, I want to have the user be part of a particular community that has to exist. If I want the if I want the community to be represented by a particular piece of media, piece of media to exist. Um, so, yeah, all that we'll, we can show, and we'll have time to, to go through any of that stuff in greater detail a little bit. And then finally, um, we have our um, import sheets. So um, this is where we stage our batch. Um, you can take any source and turn it into a template, but when it gets imported into the site, it has to follow the template. Um, to get a Mukidu CSV template, you can go into the dashboard, import digital heritage metadata, and there's a link to download a template in there. And zoom in, it's right there. And that'll just download a CSV that you can use to um, put in all of the metadata you could possibly want to put in those items. Um, one thing, if you get the template from us, we include a mapping sheet. Um, and the mapping sheet is just like an example of what's required with instructions on how to use it. Um, so the UUID field, um, and it's actually I'm still cleaning up from a long time ago. I, I named it UUID, but the, it's actually GUID. <laughs> That's what it's called in the thing. Yeah. This, this, this do, these documents are, are spectacular. I mean, they're, um, uh, they're, they're not just a bunch of spreadsheets, but they're actually spreadsheets that do stuff. Mm -hmm. um, they, can, they, they take a lot of the pain of translating from any source. So in this case, Christopher had, a, had source, sources of content to just one source document, and then they effectively, through a lot of Kelly's effort, magically translate that into beautiful code um, that then can just be imported directly. And that's that's how the Canistock Rock mm -hmm. project, for example, was built. Yeah. So you don't have to be a coder or you know, a programmer or know a whole bunch about spreadsheets to take advantage of this, and that's another one of the key points. Yes, yeah, so we'll notice that this is um, Christopher's source, and um, he just, uh, most of the fields actually matched up very nicely, but we do have a couple of extra fields that are not metadata for that um, Mukudu sees those metadata fields. So we have column G, the project initiative, um, column S, the art form, and column AF, the neighborhood. So, you know, if you have those additional fields or fields that don't quite match up to what Mukudu calls them, the mapping sheet comes in handy because you can say like when I say language or when I say art form, what I really mean is these are going to be categories, you know, so then you can take Get everything set up in the terminology that you feel is comfortable for yourself and then you go into a template. And you can map them. So if I go into one of these items. And look at the formula bar. It's pulling from the source sheet. Um, so that's as easy as going equals and then finding your source field. And I think it was, sorry, because I have it going into two, I just want to make sure that I'm doing the right one. Okay and clicking on the field and pressing enter and it'll put it in there so yeah and again these are things you don't have to know right now but uh but we're just trying we're really trying to make it the whole process a lot more that's right yeah. yes um and then when you're ready to import into mukudu you simply go to file and download as csv or in excel you can save as csv um 
I will point out that the reason that we do this in Google Docs and not in Excel is because um, Google Docs exports the CSV into UTF-8 format, um, which is super important if you have any special characters. And Christopher, you probably know a lot about special characters because you have an accent in your last name. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's English bias, pretty much. Yeah, I do. English bias. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> so to make sure that the last name, yeah. your last name has an accent down, that we want, we use Google Docs. Click on the Winston one. Which one? Winston, next one down. Mm -hmm. So here we have Winston uh, with some quotes around the name. Um, quotes, diacritics, all these things tend to be just really challenging to deal with with uh, with, with comma separated uh, text, comma CSV, comma separated values. And um, the Google team has done a really fine job of making sure that um, at the code level, the bomb level, as it's called, mm -hmm. this stuff is actually being held and structured. So works pretty well. Yeah, I mean, I, I kept it pretty simple with the name. The names that I have in my archive, I think, it, you know, usually drive Excel sheets crazy, you know, or it's just, you know, or we could break down databases, you know, it's, so that's really important. It is, and we've done projects in, uh, you know, in, in, in Thai, uh, in, in all sorts of languages, um, Uspreem, uh, Salish, uh, you know, and the characters actually survive, which is really cool. Mm. Really neat. Mm -hmm. All right. Shadow well. <laughs> Yeah. Um, all right, so now we are going to take all of these resources and actually build the live site for you guys. Um, so, uh, exit out. Um, I showed you how to export these CSVs. And um, they're actually, if I go to the live site, um, I've done all of the um, initial building, but we'll take you behind the scenes of some of those blocks. Right, so that, here's another point to talk about live versus live, totally confusing. So uh -huh. you'll see that this the URL here is live mukadu 523 pantheon.io. So the site is live, as in it is accessible on the internet. If you put that URL in, you will see this site. Mm -hmm. But it's not live in the sense of, of the fact that it, um, it doesn't have a what's called a friendly URL, uh, which could be, you know, Whatever, uh, whatever Chris wanted to call it. Um, so that is the process of taking the site live. is is actually a whole part of the process that we have described and will continue to describe today um, as we move forward. All right. Um, let's enter the site. <laughs> so. Um, we had set up, I had set up these um, projects um, within the site um, before importing the batches just because um, I found a lot of um, Christopher's projects and initiatives tied into, um, or items tied into the same sorts of general set of projects. So we created a cultural protocol called projects that was just a general cultural, general open cultural protocol. Um, and then there's also a cultural protocol called do, 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 initiatives, which I don't see. So I, I think I made that a community only cultural protocol. All right, we're not logged in, so that's, that's working. <laughs> uh, Chris, can you talk a little bit about these projects for us? Just to make it help. Okay. Sure. Yeah, um, it, it was it was actually just an interesting point to think about you know, uh, material that I would archive, um, and now material that was going to go, you know, to be viewed by the public. So it's almost this weird thing where you're kind of like a librarian, but also a, a curator. You know, you're trying to uh, uh, present these these different, all this field work and programs in a, in a way that connects. So basically, as I said before, my job is to do kind of like multiple things, but one of them is presentation. So. Every year, um, you know, I get money from different sources, the NEA and things like that. And usually, you come up with like almost like a, a series uh, under a theme. 
Um, so you'll see the Sweetest Song Festival 2014. Um, that was basically 13 public programs that were looking at um, traditional singers um, in, in Brooklyn from various um, communities. So, uh, you know, we have Guyanese folk music and, and, you know, how song plays into ritual or songs of devotion. So it, it was just a series of different programs. Um, and so that was just one instance of a project. But um, at the same time, on top of it, within each program, there could be, you know, 10 different artists that I might have field work on. Um, for example, the Guyanese uh, um, singer J.G. Hopkins. So here I was able to put some material uh, of him performing, um, but also um, able to add some field work interviews that I have with him um, on top of that. Um, the next program is um, Trouble the Water. This is something that I did in Staten Island, which was basically a look at um, doing interviews with people about uh, people that went through Hurricane Sandy, uh, but also uh, talking to different communities that have either gone through a traumatic weather-related disaster or have particular rituals um, having to do with water. Um, for example, there's a group of Sierra Leone, large Sierra Leone and Liberian community on Staten Island, some of them refugees, um, but they had very particular ideas and rituals about how to keep safe when you're living close to the water. Um, and so to have that knowledge combined with the actual experiences of people that went through this disaster, that's sort of what that program is all about. So um, that project just shows sort of the interrelated, um, you know, to, to break things down by uh, ritual or different categories having to do with traditional knowledge or knowledge in general. That was a, a fun program to, to put together, um, but it was, it's, it's almost it comes to life in a, in a, in a situation like this. Um, the Place Matters project is something that uh, is sponsored by a place called Sigilor, um, and what they do is they work with the public sector folklorists throughout the city to focus on place, to focus on neighborhoods. New York City is, is, is so neighborhood-centric, so, you know, we don't necessarily, some people will think in terms of, oh, I'm part of the Guyanese community, but a lot of times people will just say, I live in Flatbush, or I live in, you know, Bay Ridge, or, so, it, so that project, Place Matters, was actually looking at a neighborhood in um, Staten Island called Port Richmond, um, which is a huge, lar very large Mexican population. So um, it was just some tours that you know I put together with people in that community to give their idea of uh, that neighborhood. Um, so yeah, that's that's and that, then the the fun thing was to put together that 9/11 memorial project that was. Uh, on the bottom, I, I sort of wanted to include that because that's an example of me kind of digging into the archive here at Brooklyn Arts Council. This is a, a 10 year project that my uh, um, uh, predecessor, Kay Turner, put together. Um, so she did a series of exhibits and, and every year did a program that commemorated um, or, or dealt with memorializing um, the tragedy of 9 11, whether it's through photo exhibits. Um, and these, it's such an incredible collection she has. So I was able to scan some of her photos. I mean, something I'm constantly working on, but then to sort of bring that to life um, and to find the connections between, you know, tagging that into, you know, some of the photographers were, uh, you know, you know, from this Polish community in Williamsburg, but also, so all these different things. So that's sort of an idea of the project focused, um, type of job I have, but it's able to really unravel into something larger uh, through this, uh, through Nukadu. Awesome. It's fabulous. Thank you. <clears throat> and I'm actually going to delete the sample item. <laughs> <laughs> Crossing the I's and uh, dotting the T's. Okay. Um, uh, just, uh, just something you touched on a couple things quickly. Okay. One would be that you have, um, where you have a project, as you mentioned, that it deals with uh, ritual uses of uh, water, say. You could create a protocol of, around the ritual use of water, call it whatever you wish, of course. Um, and of course, dialoguing with the community as to what term might actually be useful to, to define that. Um, and then either mark it as community or strict uh, in order to, to achieve um, that differential access we could talk about. You also mentioned field notes or field interviews, et cetera. One of our greatest hopes for MUCU CMS is that it does become finally a singular place where 
all that content can dwell and be together. Um, because because of, of issues around privacy and security, um, there is just a tendency to put the stuff that really matters the most not in the safest place, like like in your content management system. So that is really yeah. what we're hoping that this is going to be able to achieve. So oh, that's great. So. Um, should we import some digital heritage? Um, I think um, I would like to see if I mm -hmm. could. Uh, so two days ago, the site didn't even exist. <laughs> so it would be neat to show if you would to go back to say this is start with a, the um, either the front page or here, okay. and just kind of walk people through um, the how you know because we you wouldn't see how Kelly does this stuff, but yeah. the whole point of this this webinar is to point out that you really can do as much of this as you want to do yourself. Mm -hmm. um, that's every one of those things. So. We can just walk through, um, and it's beautiful. It looks fantastic. I think. I think. You like it, Chris? It I love great. it. Oh, I love it. Yeah, it's awesome. That's great. So, can you walk through maybe? Yeah, I mean, I would, if you showed the front, whatever you think is easiest to start for the mm -hmm. translation, either the front page or the protocols, the communities, and just kind of how they translate into we could do that. Would be, I think that'd be really great. Yeah, I wish I had prepared just like a vanilla site so that we could see. You know what you get when you first get a Mukudu site. It's really just like it's got a Mukudu logo. Yeah, I mean the, uh, the reason that that's less important now is because with Mukudu 2.0, there's going to be this amazing dashboard that basically walks you through the process that doesn't yeah. exist right now. Mm -hmm. But now, if you actually go ahead and go to the dashboard, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Enough. So <laughs> every site, um, when you were a new site admin, uh, the dashboard is your best friend. <laughs> um, it. It has of everything that you would need to set up a site um, with help text. Um, so if I were a new site admin, um, yeah, it makes it a little bit bigger. Yeah. There we go. The first thing I would do is set up the site. Um, just to kind of get a, a feeling that it's, you know, it's my site. It's I don't want the Mukudu logo on it. <laughs> I want to put my project uh, names and details. Um, so you have some basic options. You can name your site, and we've decided to name it. Um, actually, it's the Brooklyn Arts Council Cultural Repatriation Project. Um, but what you put there is what shows up on the on the top. So right. So even <clears throat> if um, by default it will show um, your site name, uh, so your site logo, your site name, and your slogan mm -hmm. up here. I've done some configurations. It doesn't. Um, because sometimes it just doesn't fit very cookie cutter, um, but it will always show it in this top tab here. Yeah. So it says cultural repatriation project in very small letters. Mm -hmm. and, and this is actually a really great point, and mm -hmm. why since we have the time, we should. That's why it's good to walk through this stuff. So whatever you call your site is what should you turn on the Google robots? It's what it's what. Is what Google is going to find. It's what the search engines are going to find. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll see that this page is called site information, pipe, the pipe character, and then the name of the site. So um, mm -hmm. what you call the site does matter. Whether you show the site name mm -hmm. itself or hide it, as, as as Kelly has decided to do, is is uh, is not really important in the sense mm -hmm. that right. it's still showing in code. So. Mm -hmm. Thinking about your slogan, thinking about your site name, and all these things actually impacts um, searchability so, and discoverability. Okay. So. so there's probably many cultural repatriation projects so the, in the world. <laughs> but if we put that in Google, we'll find a lot. So you probably would be good to call it yeah. the full thing, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That yeah. would be Brooklyn Arts Council. Yeah. That's great. Is that right? Yeah. That's perfect. Perfect. Um, and then um, the slogan, this is not an official slogan, um, but Chris, you wrote it in one of your emails to me. And so yeah, that's great. I was, we're trying to get cultural back, culture back in your hands and enhance the cap, cultural capital of the girl. Yeah. I wrote that as a slogan because I thought it was just a bite sized kind of information about the site. <laughs> I had no and, idea I even said that. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> And then the email address, um, 
it should it should probably it should be trained because yeah. this is what if you're adding a new user that's the from email address um, for registration and password resets. Um, so um, well, we we did talk about behind the scenes. So behind the scenes, since we're you know, managing about mm -hmm. 230 sites uh -huh. worldwide, um, we have a process and a method for for um, being able to kind of get the site built, get it, get it spun up. Mm -hmm. But then through the process, what we do is once you are comfortable, in this case, Chris, if you were comfortable, you say, yeah, I'm ready to take control of this, give me the wheel. We just change that URL mm -hmm. to, to any URL of choice. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I, I can say from experience is um, we tend to not recommend putting a personal URL, a personal sorry, email in here, uh, just because um, roles may change. And in this case, you've inherited a job from somebody else. Mm -hmm. you probably, you know, we could have a be site admin at BAC or something like this. Right, so, right, yeah. Good point. Plus, you might get hundreds or thousands of bands. You know, like <laughs> yeah. um, and then some of the other things is um, front page. What do you want your default front page to be? Um, it will come packaged as slash home. Um, and I'll just kind of show you guys what the home page looks like. It's not going to look like too much. You didn't build out that page, but there are some. You can direct people anywhere when they come into the project. So this is the default home, and if we were to curate some items that we wanted to put on the home page, we could. Um, but since we haven't done that, it kind of it just says no. That, that was the thing that, that kind of, content content is pushed to the front page. We, we'll show you an example of that. Okay, so let's say I wanted to feature um, Place Matters on the front page. You okay with that? Yeah, yeah. Okay with that. So we would go into this item and click Edit. And um, all the way at the bottom, past all of the metadata fields, more site specific uh, fields. Um, the last one being publishing options. So um, we have just basic published. So that means is it up on the site or is it not up on the site? Um, if you are still working on curating a digital heritage item, you could easily just select not publish. Um, and then we have promoted to front page as another option. So that's and putting it featured on that home page. And then the next option is. And sticky and promoted are sticky means that when we're looking at browse, it's going to go to the top of the lists. And promoted means that it'll just show up on that front page. So I'll select both and talk about each one and press save to make sure the edits have been updated. So first, um, sticky. So if we're talking about sticky and we're going just back to the general browse page. We've noticed that this place matters has moved from the third object to the first object. Um, and that's because we made it sticky. Um, so whenever it displays a number of digital heritage items using this view, it will always go to the top of the list. I mean, this is great because you can set a sort order. So the sort order for your browse might be set by alphabetical, alphabetical by title or, or mm -hmm. by a last added. Um, but if there's certain content you want people to see every single time they come to the first hit of the browse, that's how you add it. Mm -hmm. yep. and, um, and then so that was sticky. And then there's, there was the promote my item to the front page. So if we go back to that home page where we had no features before, um, it's now showing um, a preview of this item. So you get the the title and um, a preview of the description. And if you had multiple of these, it would um, do kind of a carousel. So it would cycle through, it would show this one first and then another one, and however many items you have as promoted to the front page. Um, but instead of having this page as our home page, um, we decided to set it to the front page app. Um, and I'm going to go into that next mm -hmm. since it seems relevant. Um, you could also change your error pages. Um, that's not recommended unless you uh, 
have done it before, you know exactly what you're doing. Um, but we could easily go to the Node 6 page. And we see that this is an access denied page. So what if we wanted to put a picture or something in that page? We could, or edit the text, we could edit it. Um, yeah, so, so you know, access denied is pretty blunt. Yeah. <laughs> so you might want to say, hey, you found a page that, you know, um, has particular protocols uh, attached to it. Or mm -hmm. You could really truly name this anything you want, and you can mm -hmm. have a picture, and you can have an email. You might have somebody put come to your support page or mm -hmm. phone number. Um, whatever you want. So yeah. it's pretty cool. It's pretty nice. Yeah. But I would not change the destination because yeah, unless well, I, you really know what you're doing, um, I would just edit the page that's already provided if you feel the need to do so. They're, they're pretty standard um, mm -hmm. in, in, in Drupal, which is the code underneath the video. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the right answer for sure. Okay. Um, so we'll save the changes and we'll notice that the site name has updated up here. It says Site Information Brooklyn Arts Council Cultural Repatriation Project. Um, and then um, I'll allow you to change your email address. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about where we have um, put as the default front page. So anytime somebody puts in this URL, or once it's more friendly, anytime someone puts in a friendly URL, they go to the app. Uh, and open that up. This is just okay. remind everyone. All right, sorry, Chris. I'm going to mute you one more time, but sure. uh, just let us know. Okay. Um, so to configure that front page app, we can go to our dashboard, and under the setup site, um, we've changed the slogan and the email address. We could also change the logos, the about page, and more. Um, and down here we have a single, create a single front page app. And this is where I could go to edit uh, the, this page. Um, so in this front page app, we have multiple sections and I'm gonna collapse them to show how many sections we could possibly have. And we're currently just using three sections. <laughs> But if you wanted to, you could use up to, I think, seven. Um, Just a huge, huge, I won't say disclaimer, but we'll say clarification. Mm -hmm. This is an amazing piece of technology that was developed to, to make front page apps possible. Mm -hmm. And it's fantastic. But it does require a certain level of coding, as you're going to see. Right. In, in Mukadu 2.0, this whole thing is going to be replaced with a new capability that allows the theming of the entire site. Mm -hmm. well, however, the principles that are here that you're seeing in the content list um, and building out these sections is exactly the same regardless of technology. So mm -hmm. I just, that's my big asterisk around this. So don't get turned off if you see like, oh my god, what's this blog div thing? <laughs> uh, some of that will still be necessary to do certain magical things, but um, a lot of it's been a lot, it's, it's a lot easier. It's going to be a lot easier. Or easy, but it's going to be a lot easier. And should I show the, the app that I made? Or, or? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Chris decided everything that would go on this front page. I just coded it. Um, and we had him fill out. Let me pull it up over here, and I'll bring it into the main screen. So Kelly's pulling up a form that, that she built, um, a, a, a form that you can, you can fill out. Um, and we're going to make some format uh, form of this available to you. So you can just go in and, you, and just say, all right, well, what do you want to have on your front page? Fill out this form, and it actually provides others, us or to you or your dev team exactly what you need to actually build out the whole front page, Yeah. which is, um, I just think is amazing. <laughs> so, so nice job. Oops, sorry. Um, so yeah, when, um, when we presented this to um, Christopher, who's been our guinea pig for this forum, um, we asked, okay, what type of menu would you like? Um, with Premiere, I figured out how to put these nice little icons on the menu. Um, so you could have decided to have those menu icons or um, just text only. Um, so you select one or the other. And then, okay, for your first section, what would you like? And um, 
we've chosen a multiple image carousel to go there. And this is this is the premier site as an example, but um, we've created a multiple image carousel here. Um, I added this logo only because I wanted to make the distinction between Brooklyn Arts Council, who um, funds and and does all the coordination for this project and the actual project itself. Um, so we did want to have the Brooklyn Arts Council logo in the top corner, but also reference um, this in the site. Um, so we continue. We've chosen a front page carousel. And um, again, Chris was a guinea pig, so we just told him he needed to give us an image link. <laughs> so um, we took his images that he put in them and make sure that they were the right pixel, uh, pixelation so that they could go into Rukudo. And then we have this carousel coded here. Um, so first item, I have a naming convention so it's easy. I just have to copy the URL once. The first item, the second item, third and fourth. Um, and there's the first section for you. So this is what translates into this section here. And we're trying to make it as easy as possible. So you don't need to learn HTML to make this, um, this section. Um, further, we have the, yeah, I mean, the, the, basic, the basic plan is twofold. One is that we're actually in Rukudu 2.0. A lot of this stuff that is code will just be buttons and toggles. But the other part mm -hmm. is that we're actually coding that form so that mm -hmm. um, by virtue of you filling out bits and bobs and giving us URLs or whatever, um, when you hit the button, it actually just generates the code. You just copy and stick it in there. Wow. Pretty cool. That's great. Yeah. So this is what it kind of looks like behind the scenes. And we have um, any anytime um, you add another project. I'm surprised that it's even showing up because I have an extra S there. <laughs> um, I'm actually not going to get rid of that just in case it's intentional. Um, anytime you add a new project or add a new digital heritage item and label it under the cultural protocol project, it will show up um, here in the project page. So, um, that automatically updates as your site grows and expands. Um, and is managed by protocols. And then finally, we have the section where we have our team partners um, showing up at the bottom. So, I should save that, but I don't think I changed any. Um, and so that's what creates this front page app here. Um, and again, our sponsors are at the bottom, so we have Con Edison and the, the public funding that goes into the Brooklyn All right. So, um, let me just go back to the dashboard. So, so far we've set up the site name slogan. Um, we've created a front page app. Um, and one could change the logo. So there's two places to change the logo. And when we talk about change the, lo the logo, it's what shows up here, not this. Um, and we want to ignore all of the things that make the layouts work. But at the bottom, <laughs> You can choose a file for your logo from your directory, um, and that will populate the logo in the front page of the points. Um, and then the shortcut icon is also called a favicon, and that's this little drop that we see up here. And this drop is actually the default shortcut icon. Um, so I could uncheck that and upload a file. Um, there's really easy ways to create favicons. They have to be very, very, very small, low pixel um, icons. And usually I just like Google create, yeah, favicon generator. <laughs> there we go. Um, uh, I like the, there's one called favicon. Yeah. Uh, okay. It's favicon ico CDC generator, that one. This is a really, really great one because you get this. Um, Take, take a graphic, take a logo, stick it in there. Um, I think we have, have one, right? Should these files, yeah, sorry, one second. Yeah. Well, actually, there. Anything that we don't want to do. Well, 
Keep the mentions upload. All right, and we can see it here, and we can also see a preview here. It actually looks pretty good. Every once in a while, it'll jumble up like if you have a circle, it kind of makes it weird. But I could, you know, take a color and add a color. Um, yeah, but it's fine, and I'm just going to download it. I'm going to copy this so that I don't. It's not going to show up because we're not on the front page of Browse. Um, but then we go to the dashboard to change the logo on all other site pages. And it's essentially the same process. Um, we've set up the logo and uncheck the default. Save. There you go. Nice. There we go. Um, so we would do that with the logo, etc. cetera. Um, I've also changed the link color. Um, there's a color scheme that we could adjust. Um, I do want to note that change is not recommended for three of the four options, but we can change the tint color. Um, and I've just done that to match the Brooklyn Arts Council logo, um, which is a similar orange to the color that we already have by default, but it's a little different and I changed that. <laughs> But I, one could, you know, make it fuchsia. Mm -hmm. And I won't say those changes because that will like, hurt our eyes. <laughs> yeah, we work with uh, some organizations that have very specific uh, terms for cultural reasons, and there's no reason um, you can actually change the color to match precisely the uh, phantom color, for example, converting it to more safe. And then the last thing I did, and I don't do this for all um, sites, but I edited this custom site header um, because we had kind of an oblong header. So I just uploaded the file. And um, in this, this is just a general text field. So I could put just text in here if I wanted to, but the image button. And one could put their image URL and stuff as an entry. And that will show up. Um, actually, you have to change it to show up headers and themes <laughs> and then save. Yeah, Come so on. this is still stuff as it is now, um, and, and this stuff will be changing. Mm -hmm. uh, much more fluid processing. Not too hard, but a little bit tricky, and that's why this that's why this <laughs> training is so important. So we've gone through most of the setup of the site. The next thing one might want to do is start managing communities, users, and protocols. Um, and this is a fairly familiar process if um, you've already used Nuclear Premier and you already have an idea of what it, what the components of a digital heritage item are. Um, but I do recommend playing with different levels of protocols and sharing settings, and kind of workshopping that and testing it um, if you're not very familiar or experienced with doing that. Um, we also have sample content that you could download. And this is really where the Dev Test Live environment comes in handy because you could go on to Dev and download the sample content. And that um, imports just sample items of everything that you would need um, to kind of test and play with um, how cultural protocols interact. Um, so if we opened up this SIP, we have the various documents. Um, yeah, this is a really great set of demo content in the sense that it gives you um, each of these uh, items rec um, refers to a particular set of protocols and communities. Mm -hmm. And so 
if you're seeing a blue item and you're not supposed to see a blue item because the protocol for blue was set to community and you're not logged in, it should be a green item. <laughs> That's what this is helping you figure out. Um, yeah. So, you know, uh, it, it's, if you, if you want to kind of really understand cultural protocols and communities as, as they work, this set is really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and there's circles and squares. So this would be set, um, you know, we have, we've already figured it out. So you just have to import the batches, but you'll see as SI admin, you can see all of them and the, the triangle community is strict and the square community is um, community only, I think. Um, yep. And circles of it, and also this is a great set of content if you want to um, show people uh, within your community that the strict protocols are working, but mm -hmm. you don't want to want to show strict content. Right. This is what we call the perfect proxy content for being able to test all those all mm -hmm. those functions. Yeah. Um, however, because you have to actually create users and you have to create um, protocols um, by having it as Kelly said in Dev. Then you you have the opportunity to not have you know orange I'm sorry green circles on the front page of your site. So right. there's that. Yeah. So um, one would step one would be add the media. So you'd add everything in this folder to the media, and then step two would be importing these CSVs. So the cultural protocols. Um, step three is the communities. Four is the users, and five is the categories. So we're, we're, today we're really going deeper than we have in the past um, in these trainings to talk through how kind of to do this stuff in production mode and batch. Because, and this is how a site can get built in three days. Yeah. But everything that Kelly's showing can be done on the front end. So you can, of course, you can add users. You can add, you just log in as admin and you can go in and you can create users and they can have the mm -hmm. different roles. And then you can add uh, media um, items on the front end. You can add um, the uh, digital heritage items. Mm -hmm. um, so all that can be done on, on front end. And there are contexts where actually it could be faster. For example, we were working on, again on a project in Thailand where we had you know, 20 people around the table mm -hmm. um, who all had their sets of protocols and communities. So they were able to just all go in the front end in real time mm -hmm. and build out you know, 40 different protocols and communities. It was pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. So there are advantages and disadvantages to both, and that's why we provide both options. Yeah. Well, why don't you just give the time, what we... Um, Import the digital heritage items? Yeah, do you have, do you have more to add? Um, yeah, so um, I had added those digital heritage items to the dev site, but not uh. to the live site. So I just wanted to um, show the process of taking the CSV that we had, and um, it's not here. I think I closed. Here we go. Taking these CSVs that we have already staged, um, and of course we downloaded them, so I'm not going to download them again, um, and, and importing them into the site. And it's a fairly simple process once you have it down. So first, um, as I said earlier, you want to add the media. So batch add media files. And this will bring you a box, and it does say drag files here, but if I drag the files there, they don't show you. So that's a... That's a 1.5 bug. That's a one point, known bug of 1.5. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to find, take half off screen. <laughs> ah, I can't do half off screen. Okay. I'll find... Um, you can do it off screen. The media that I want to add. <laughs> Okay, and I'm going to bring this back on screen to yeah. show the size limits. So you might notice I have MP4s. Um, so and I've, movies. I've created um, movies out of some of the audio files. Um, we have various representation formats, and the way that I distinguish between the original and the representation is I add a underscore R to the original file name. Um, usually, I was doing this last night, <laughs> and uh, and I put them all in one folder. That's very clear. It's what's going into Mukudu, um, and we'll just select those all and open. And it's going to give me a number of errors saying that the file is too large. That's one of the limitations of 1.5 is that you can't actually put in files that are larger than 100 megabytes. 
um, down there. And that, part of that has to do with the fact that we're running the sites um, with the courtesy um, and generosity of, of Pantheon mm -hmm. as a partner. And um, if we let you put a terabyte of content up, we'd actually have to pay a lot of money to, mm -hmm. to handle that. But that, that, that limitation is going to be released um, with 2.0, which would be yeah. good but in the case um, for now, I typically will add those video or audio files to Vimeo or SoundCloud. Um, and um, that way it's being hosted in a different environment. And there's various um, privacy settings and protocols you can use in those particular sites that um, will help you to keep the content actually yours. So you might put on Within, um, within the reasons, as we know, of the terms of service, but for content where it has been agreed upon by the community that they can have that, or for, for content that is already hosted on some form of social media tool, um, that is a great advantage for mm -hmm. um, basically getting around this. Okay, so we have to have these multiple files, and um, this is just a confirmation screen that they've been uploaded correctly. Um, they will get their metadata from the images if you've embedded any metadata, but um, this gives you an opportunity to add a caption if you'd like. Um, we'll just kind of ignore this screen for the sake of time and go on to adding the digital heritage metadata. Um, so we'll import, you can do this from um, this middle menu of ma managing content, or you can do it from the Wikipedia demo content. The links actually go to the same places. <laughs> and you already added the communities and blah, blah, all that good stuff? The communities, the protocols, they're all added um, because I pushed it from dev to live um, after I added those things. And I did have the foresight to not add the cultural heritage items until. So I'm going to pull this off screen. Um, we work with a lot of various communities, so I just want to ensure that I'm not showing any. Okay, so we've downloaded the media CSV, the media CSV, and I'm just going to open that here and press import file. And we're going to see if it was successful. Um, so we have created seven nodes, which was the amount of digital heritage items in that sheet. Um, but we have a couple of errors, and that was they failed to get the file object for those files that were more than 100 megabytes. Um, so even though this was a failure for the media, um, it still created the items, and we knew that we were going to have that error because we got the error with the actual media. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of ways that that could be addressed. I put press back on. So. Um, Mm -hmm. what one would be um, we could go in and, and relax constraint about the 100 megabyte limit we could actually process that content mm -hmm. for smaller we could put it up on some other uh, service um, and there's a variety of them and they're not it's not just YouTube and Vimeo but with there's others Vimeo is really nice because Vimeo does provide password um, uh, access control um, and that's how we build out a lot of the content that was on the Amazon wrap project for example so a variety of different ways but as you can see, it still creates the item itself, even though the media item isn't linked, all the other content is there. So and, then, sure. and then would I just embed it if I if I did have it on Vimeo and it wasn't accepting it as a as a you know an MPEG4, would I just yeah. take the embed? Yeah, um, Do you have any are, are any of these items on some other thing? Yeah, I think I yes. I think um, I'm not sure which ones didn't get accepted, but uh, yeah, they'll probably. I probably took them all from most of them from Vimeo. I'm not sure. And let, those WAV files, no, those are just on SoundCloud, I think. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. right, right. Uh, yeah, I think so. But in the WAV files, um, the MP4s that were converted um, certainly could be um, made made smaller to fit mm -hmm. for sure. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, there are some uh, resources in our support. I think at premier.mukadu.org um, that shows uh, how to um, add a SoundCloud file and how to add a Vimeo or YouTube file to a digital heritage item. Um, so you could do that manually. Uh, you could do it in batch as well. Oh, that's so. 
Uh, they're on the SHM, but I think that I've also put them on. Well. we'll make for for sure for this. We'll make some links, but uh, let's take a look at. Uh, mm -hmm. And then one more. I'm going to upload the uh, files that were internet. Right. So the way it works right now is that you. Um, you, you have to do one import of items where, uh, where you have an actual item file name, and you do a different one if they're web based URLs. Just the way, the way it's built, and um, we've got some fairly clean workflows for both of those. Now we can browse the archive, and we will notice that these files. These digital heritage items have been created. So we actually now have two pages worth of digital heritage items. Um, and that took uh, a little bit of work on the back end, but once you get the batch import process like down, you know all the rules for the column headers, and um, you're confident in using the import tool, it will literally be a success every single time. Hmm. Um, and it takes, it goes down from Taking a couple hours the first time to 25 minutes the second time, 10 minutes the third time to like five minutes. <laughs> and that, we got thousands of items into the Cancel Draw project, and we have lots of projects where we're working where uh, you know, right? so hundreds, if not thousands, of items in a day. Mm -hmm. Can you log out so we can take a look at a couple items? So we'll log out so we don't hit the wrong button. Uh, but just uh, take some stuff out. Um, I believe this one's only available. This might be a good example. Okay. So the Brooklyn Arts Council has set their Vimeos to only display on oh. um, Which is great because Vimeo has such clearly defined access parameters for your videos. So I could click, this is still available to watch, and I could click through the video, but um, Chris, as a as a admin of this account or you know, whoever, whoever has access to the video account could log in and change that setting. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it literally says allow to be embedded on other sites. Got it, yeah. Click it or unclick it. Um, and, if, and if you unclick it now, then it will actually show up. Yeah. There's another really cool thing. You said that the thing that's neat about content that does live in other places mm -hmm. is that if, ch if, if changes are made, then it does impact um, the mm -hmm. item here. But, but mm -hmm. it also works in reverse. So if, if items are, are, are taken down or, or modified, they're going to disappear. Mm -hmm. So yeah. which can actually kind of be a good thing uh, depending on the context. Mm -hmm. right. but, well, but notice we still got the thumbnail, which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, there we go. Um, so nice. this item was successfully embedded. Um, and we got the description, a really rich cultural narrative. Um, one could log in or register to post comments. Um, we could turn uh, anonymous registration off. Um, and um, if we wanted to see everything that had to do with Mexico, for instance, it takes us to the community page. Um, space and place. Mm -hmm. um, you can change this to a list view right now. It's a grid view. But, um, here's one of the wave files that did successfully get imported, but I did pair it with an image representation. So, even though the audio is not there. And if you had it on sound, you could embed the, the, yes. the sound Got it. So we've got a couple of minutes left, so why don't we just talk through, um, Chris, let's talk through what, what you have, what you see, what we, where you might uh, see people go, open it up to questions and thoughts, um, and then, um, and before we all deal with that, basically, as I said in the outcomes, um, we just covered a lot in, in, in less than two hours, but you can see that sites can be built and they can be beautiful in 
and in a matter of days, and the tools that we have been building over the last year are only willing to give to anybody who wants them. Um, so some of the best ways, if you're interested in building sites, is just to get in touch with us, and um, we will continue to provide, provide these resources to everyone. Um, so you know, we're, we're here to help. Also, the support pages at support.mukudu.org, uh, support.mukudu.net, and everything else. So we'll be making sure we note in the playlist notes today all lead to the same base of information and knowledge, um, which is really cool. So go in and, and do some of these things. And Kelly pointed out that we've actually started to embed uh, right in, in Premiere um, examples for how to do things like add SoundCloud or, or whatever mm -hmm. else. And uh, you know we're we're at this crossing point where it's where we're spurning down how much different help text we're adding within we could do because well, it's going to be fairly different. Um, in, that's just the other part of the, of the where we are at on the network. So Chris, what's next? Yeah, uh, you know I have a ton of. Uh, content that I would love to just, I would, you know, I would just really like to start putting this into my workflow. And, and how would you recommend doing that as far as, you know, is it working with that, like, you know, that Excel spreadsheet and just getting used to batch imports and things like that? I mean, what's, what's the best way to, to, um, to start, you know, adding content or staging content? Yeah, I mean, I would say now, now you've seen how it's all come, and this is the, the result. And I, by the way, I just want to say once again to Kelly, thank you so much. This is it's gorgeous. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's awesome. also have really beautiful content, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I would say that given the timing, um, work, working through that process of, of pivoting from working with the sites and beautiful and awesome, bringing the content back down and building out those sheets going to be totally worth its weight in gold, totally not a loss of time and effort, be, and, and will translate very well into uh -huh. right? adding a whole bunch of content directly to the site uh, without thinking through that additional step will be less useful for reason. Got it. Uh, so, you know, we'll, in a follow-up meeting, we, we can talk through exactly how to do that. And, uh, and also, before we um, Sign off. I do want to mention the export process. So, um, if we wanted to back up copies of the metadata at any point in time, or copies of the, Im the images at any point in time, um, I could simply select all items on all pages, um, export items by field. Um, there's some medium steps. This um, any field not to include. This is a feature in case um, the official narratives are, are something you want to keep within your organization, or if it's going outside of your organization, you can be aware of what information you're giving to whomever you're giving it to. We'll just keep everything there. Um, continue. Yeah, if you want, if you wanted to not provide the latitude longitude. Thing. You know, this is a great way to, to build out content very richly, but then toggle off any fields that you don't necessarily want to share, like the library or something. Yeah. Um, and then it gives you a CSV and a zip. Um, and then the CSV, when I download that, um, looks familiar. <laughs> this is um, nice. the CSV. The only difference, and an important difference, if you are going to be importing CSVs or editing the metadata is that once it's already created in the site, um, you want to have the node ID. So you could easily um, delete the top row <laughs> and then change where um, the media is coming from or the community um, on in a batch. Um, and then download this again as a CSV and then re-import it. So I mean, this this is this, what's so great about this is that you can you may stage a bunch of content. Um, Chris, I'm speaking specifically to you now. Maybe and you kind of go back to uh, the community that was um, working on the the 
or didn't say any stuff, and say, hey, check this stuff out, you know, what do you think? Um, they could actually edit it. They could add comments. Nice. And then you could pull all that stuff down, and that's the whole, I, the whole right. point here. It's pretty sweet. Yeah, I love uh, that. When you download the zip file, you are downloading the original assets, right. um, and and they and we've tested that to death. So there, that's also a really cool thing. So mm -hmm. that's great. And then also going back to the importance of um, embedding um, information into your media and metadata, that whole life cycle of your um, images, et cetera, um, that's, uh, that all pays off in the end because Mukudu deserves the original metadata. So this description of this item was brought in. And when we go to see the original item, we see the the one you go to download that again, it'll be there. Nice. Okay, uh, looking at the clock, time <laughs> does fly. Um, anyone else have are there any questions? Um, from anyone? Hope this was a useful journey, um, and uh, we're you know we're we're here. Like I said, any questions you can ask now, or we'll, we'd be happy to hear. Then afterwards, um, you're going to be asked to, to fill out a summary, so maybe you might have some questions there, but by all means, I'm sure we gave you a lot to think about. Um, and great, um, the Amy Lotus Omar <laughs> group is asking about loving to learn about the batch upload and mapping to the future. Absolutely. So like I said, we really think we want, we're going to wait until after the first year when we have a much better idea of what's happening with uh, the 2.0 uh, for that process. However, that said, um, we did as an internal trial run uh, the, the whole, our whole archival workflow that we've worked out specifically for images and video, and um, we're definitely going to do a uh, kind of an added bonus webinar specifically on that workflow. We're really excited about it. It's mm -hmm. pretty cool. So what, what you just saw as, as uh, what Kelly just showed you a little tiny bit of metadata. Imagine that whole thing on the asset level completely filled out mm -hmm. with phenomenal stuff. So with that, we're going to say goodbye for now. Um, Chris will be in touch, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Gretchen, thank you. and thank you to everybody. Um, I, I, I want to just, again, put out a huge thank you to Chris for all of your effort on, on giving this great content, working very um, collaboratively with this, but also to Kelly, who's poured a lot of love into building this. So, so thank you both. And thank you to everyone who's been listening, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Guys. Right, thanks. Wow.